Good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to our Monday evening session. I hope you've had a lovely weekend and looking forward to the whole of this week. You know, with God, every day is a blessing. So today we are going to look at what is hindering you. What is hindering you? We are going to just bow our heads and pray, ask the Holy Spirit to be a part of what we are doing this evening. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, be our teacher, open our ears, our spiritual ears, and grant us minds that are understanding and hearts that are willing to receive. And we pray that the word that goes out will be like seed. It will fall on fertile ground and that, Father, much fruit will come out of it. We pray for every person that's going to be listening to this session. We pray for those that will watch it afterwards. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will do a deep work in their hearts and that you will continue to reveal yourself and open up their minds to the scriptures. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. Hello. I'm excited about the word of God. I hope you are excited too because God is always doing great things. You know, God never sleeps. He's never tired. He is always wide awake, watching over us and doing great things on our behalf. But we all know that there are times when we feel like, you know, we want to move ahead with God. We want to move on. We want to run. We want to sprint and yet there's something holding us back. There's something hindering. There's something stopping us from being or doing the thing that is in our heart to do. There's something that is blocking us from being where we ought to be. So we want to look at a few examples. Perhaps we can identify things that are hindering us from fulfilling our calling in life and our destiny. Okay, what is hindering you? We want to look at the story of Naaman, the Syrian. You know, the Bible tells us that Naaman was the captain of the Syrian army. He was a very great man, very powerful, honored, and respected all over his country and by other armies and other, you know, captains of other armies. And yet the Bible say, in all his fame, in all, everything that he had done, Naaman had one problem. He had leprosy. He had leprosy. All his fame, his wealth, his power, nothing could help do, do away with this leprosy. One day, a young girl, the servant of his wife, said to her mistress, You know, in the country where I come from, there is a prophet of God. If my master would go and visit the prophet, he can cleanse him of his leprosy. And the wife tells Naaman, and Naaman takes his gold, all his wealth, he takes beautiful clothing and everything, and he makes his journey to go and find the king of Israel. And to cut the story short, he ends <coughs> up in front of who? The prophet of God. You know, he goes to the prophet of God, and something happens there. Let's, if you have a Bible, I'm going to read from 2 Kings chapter 5. I'll read verse 10 and 11. It says, And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be made clean. But Naaman was wroth he was angry and he went away and said behold i thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the lord his god and strike his hand over the place and recover my leprosy in this verse alone there lies a great secret listen to what naman is saying the prophet has given him instructions, go and wash in the river Jordan and your healing will come to you. But Naaman is saying, well, 
shouldn't he have at least come out and respect me and honor me as a great warrior, as a great captain? Shouldn't he have at least, you know, we, we all have our prescribed way of thinking this is the way God should work. This is the way God should speak to me. This is the way things ought to happen. And this is how things should go. And most of the time, because we have a certain expectation, when God does things differently from the way we want God to do things, we miss our miracle. We fail because that's not the expectation. That's not the norma. Here is a man desperate to be healed. Come all the way. He didn't lack in the desire. He desired healing. He traveled a long way to come and get his healing. But he stumbles over a small thing. He stumbles because he has his own expectation. This is how God should meet my needs. This is how God should work. This is what is supposed to happen. And when it happened differently, he wouldn't receive it. He wanted to be honored. When that honor didn't come, he felt humiliated. He felt made small. So what was the problem here? Pride. Pride. Pride was the thing that hindered him. Pride was the thing that stood between him and his miracle. Pride was the thing that stood between him and his salvation. So he walks away. He's angry. His pride is wounded. The man didn't honor me, he didn't respect me. I thought he should do things this way and he's, he's just giving me an instruction. That's not good enough. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm just going to go back home and heal. Many, many people have fallen into the same trap. They miss their healing. They miss their miracle. They miss God's best for their lives because things went happening according to their plan. Things went happening according to the way they wanted things to happen. Now, I want you to see something else. You know, God looks in the hearts of men. Naaman comes wanting healing, but God looks in his heart and thinks, Naaman wants physical healing, but he has a spiritual problem. He has a disease in the spirit, which is more serious than his leprosy in his physical body. So God decides, I'm going to deal with the spiritual first before I deal with the physical. So most of the time, that's what we don't understand, that God is more interested in the spiritual than in the physical. So when we come before God he, with our physical needs, with our natural needs, God is looking at the inner man he is looking at the spiritual needs. And once the healing takes place in the inside, the outside healing manifests very quickly. It manifests even quicker. So Nama now has to deal first with the issue with that sickness of the heart. He has to deal with the sickness that is in the inner man. The servants say, my Lord. If the man of God had asked you to go and do something great, would you not have done it? And yet he has asked you to do something so small, but you are struggling with it. So he's saying, my Lord, are you going to allow your pride to hinder your healing? Are you going to allow your pride to rob you of a miracle? Are you prepared to go back with your leprosy Oh, because you didn't want to submit to the word of the man of God. So Naaman repents of his pride and he reluctantly goes to the river. And no wonder he had to do it seven times so that he would be completely broken by the seventh time. Remember, number seven means completeness. And number seven also states what, you know, perfection so he had to go in seven times until God had dealt totally with the inner man. And then when he came out the seventh time, the outside man was totally redeemed, healed, and set free. So the problem with Naaman, it was his pride that hindered him. It was his pride that stood in the way. 
And many a time we do not see ourselves. We do not see what's wrong with us. We do not see what is hindering or blocking us. But God in his mercy, he will allow things to happen in our life. Circumstances to come to us to open our understanding so that we can see what is wrong with us. Then if we are willing, we can then deal with that. We can then deal with that. But then we see again another incident where this time it's involving a rich young man, the rich young ruler in, March, in, in the book of, of Mark chapter 10, verse 21 and 22. So this young man, he desires to be a follower of Jesus. He wants to know Jesus. He wants to know the power that Jesus carries. He wants to be part of the team. He wants to be one of the disciples. So he comes to Jesus. He's got a desire. Master, what can I do to receive eternal life? I want this life you are talking about. I want to inherit it. You know, today we say, I want to be in the kingdom. I want to make it to the rapture. I want to be raptured. I want to be there among the numbered faithful ones. And Jesus looks in the heart of this man Again, he is not looking in the outward appearance. He is looking in the heart of the man. Yes, you have the desire. Yes, your desire is right. Everything is right, but there is just one thing that is lacking. Jesus says to the one to the young man, just one thing. That's the one thing that is standing between you and your salvation. That's the one thing that is hindering you from becoming what God wants you to be. And he says to the young man, go and sell everything that you have. Give the money to the poor and then you come and follow me. And sadly, the Bible says, the man was very, very disappointed. Very, very disappointed because he was very rich. He had great possessions. Verse 22 says, he was sad at that saying and went away grieved, just like Naaman went away grieved. But thank God Naaman had somebody that was there who said, Master, you cannot allow the enemy to rob you. You cannot allow this thing to stand between you and your miracle. You cannot allow this thing to hinder you. But this poor young man, he didn't have anyone there. So he turned away from the Lord, grieved, disappointed. So what was the problem? His wealth, his position, his material things, they became a hindrance. His possession stood between him and salvation. They stood between him and the Lord Jesus Christ. They st stood between him and his relationship with God because he turned away rather than give up those things. He walked away disappointed. What is hindering you today? What is standing between you and your relationship with God? What is standing between you and your miracle? Ask yourself the question. Church, I want to say to everyone who's out there, whether you are a believer or not a believer, but believe me, the rapture is not far away. The end is not far away. The bride is almost here, coming for the bridegroom. What is hindering us from getting ready? What is hindering you from getting ready, getting to that state where God wants you to be? What is blocking? This, we know with Naaman, it was his pride. Now with this young man, it was his wealth. It was not only the money. You know, sometimes when we look at the wealth issue, we are thinking money, money, money. It wasn't only the money. It was what the money brought to this young man. It brought honor. It brought positioning. You know, he had a high position in the community. When he passed, the other poor men bowed, you know. They honored him. They bowed before him. When he walked into the place, they would stand up and offer him a seat. So it was all these things 
having that honor and that respect of people that stood in his way. Some of us want the respect from other people. We want to be honored by other people. And that becomes a hindrance. So this young man was hindered because he wanted position, he wanted power, he wanted honor, he wanted respect, but from the wrong sources. And it hindered him. And he went away with absolutely nothing. He went away with nothing. Naaman got Naaman repented and went and did what he was told and he went away a brand new man but this young man would not give up he would not repent he didn't even come back after he had thought about it probably the more he considered the more he thought about it the harder his heart became he hardened his heart and therefore missed an opportunity of a lifetime one day on the day of judgment, he will look and regret how he allowed useless things to control, to, take, to hinder him from being what God had intended him to be. Now, we look at another situation, another person that also faced the same situation. I'm hoping that with these, we can identify for ourselves each one can identify in your own life what is it that is hindering you what is it that is blocking you from praying what is it that is blocking you from studying the word what is it that is blocking you from going to church what is it that is blocking you from drawing closer to god because the time is running out and we need to get right with god if you remember the vision that i shared is it a month back that God says the time is suspended, but only for a short while to allow people to make right with God, to allow people to get back their lost love for God, to allow the prodigals to come to their senses and return back to God. But that door is not going to remain open forever. The door will shut one day and it will be too late to do anything about it so consider your own life is it pride that is hindering you is it fame that is hindering you is it the love for position for power for respect from other people is that the thing that is hindering you standing between you and your god standing between your miracle is it because you fear people you are some people are afraid to become christians because what will my friends say everybody's going to laugh at me they're going to think that i'm mad being a christian but i would rather people laughed and thought i was mad and i know what i'm doing but do not let it hinder you from moving on with god now we read in luke chapter 19 from verse 1 that Jesus had to go through Jericho. Jesus had to go through Jericho. I want you to mark that word. It clearly said that he needed to go through Jericho. Why did he need to go through Jericho? Because there was someone there that God was waiting for. There was someone there that God needed to touch and that was the woman the samaritan woman from jericho do you know that god goes out of his way to find you he goes out of his way to find you because of the desire that is in your heart and he goes out of the way to come and present himself to you this woman although the community looked down upon her hated her thought she was an evil woman what they did not know was the cry of her heart in the midnight hour alone in her bedroom she would cry out to god she would cry out because she was tired of her life she was tired of who she was she wanted change but she didn't know how to change she didn't know what to do but god who hears in the secret heard a cry and jesus had to go 
through to Jericho because there was an appointment made for him by the father to meet this woman in Jericho. And when he meets this woman and he gives the woman a word, the woman's got a choice. Either she can lie to the Lord and pretend to be a good woman. Oh, my husband is at home, you know, and pretend. But this woman is so tired of a life of pretense. She's so tired of the life of lying. This woman is just come to the end of a road and she says, oh, I don't have a husband. I don't have a husband. Jesus said, yes, you are telling the truth because even the one you ha you've had so many and the one you have now is not even your husband either. And then the conversation began. Can you believe if this woman had lied and say, oh, my husband's at work, you know, what would have happened? The conversation would have taken a different tone altogether. But because this woman was tired, this woman was tired of living a lie and pretending to be something else that she wasn't. She was tired for, she said, I'm going to just come out in the open. I'm going to tell this man the truth about who I am so he knows what he's talking to. And because of that openness, a miracle came to her that day. Is it your, the lies that we hide behind that are blocking our miracle? Is it the pretenses that we are putting in front? We are wearing masks and we are pretending and pretending and pretending that God cannot reach us behind our masks, behind the lies that we tell, behind the pretenses that we give. You know, God wants us to come out openly and say, God, this is who I am, because God knows anyway. So this woman came out openly and God met her and said, I know you are thirsty, woman. I know you are hungry, woman. I know that you need help, woman. That is why I am here. I am the water of life. If you drink of me, you will never ever thirst again. You will never ever have that empty hollow feeling without you, within you, because I will feel that emptiness within you. You won't need a man to fill your life again ever. And this woman went away rejoicing, ran to the city to tell everybody because something had happened in her life but she had a choice an instant a minute a moment to make that decision whether she will allow her pride or her lies or her, uh, her masks to to hinder her from allowing the lord to see through her from allowing the lord to minister and to touch her life what is it that is hindering you today You know, the story that really amazes me is the story of the, the, the short man Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'll read verse 1 to 3. It says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press because he was little in stature. What hinders you? There is Zacchaeus. He wants to meet Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. But the crowds are too many. There is just too many people. And he's a short little man. In the crowds, there's no way Jesus is going to see him in the crowds. So Zacchaeus is saying, I'm not going to let my height block me. I'm not going to let my height hinder me. But this was not the only hindrance in this man's life. He was a tax collector whom the people regarded as a thief. But he was a man of position, a man of authority. And yet he wouldn't even allow that to stand in the way. Can you imagine this man of authority and power, well known, running like a little boy, and climbing up a tree like a little boy and standing up, climbing the chair and looking around. You see, Zacchaeus put down his pride. He forgot about his position in life. He forgot about his wealth. He forgot about the people around him. He had one thing in mind. I must see Jesus. I must see Jesus. And when Jesus 
came passing by, believe it, what happened? Jesus stops right there by the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. You know, Zacchaeus had an appointment with the Lord. His heart desired to see Jesus. And God says he will grant us our heart's desire. But you see, you can have a desire if you don't do anything. That desire will never come to pass. Zacchaeus could have sat at home. He could have felt sorry for himself. Oh, I'm too short. There's no point in trying anything. He could have allowed anything to block him. He could have allowed anything to stand in the way. What will my servants think when they see me running up the tree? What will the people around me, they're going to laugh at me and mock me and say all kinds of things. All that was irrelevant. He didn't think of it at that moment. He had one focus, one vision. I must see Jesus. I must see Jesus. What is your focus this evening? What is blocking you from seeing Jesus? Is it your stature? Like uh, he was a short man. Are you ashamed of yourself, the way you look? Is it because you got low self-image? You think that, you know, no one's going listen, to listen to me. No one's going to look at me. Look at me. Who's going to listen to anything I got to say? Are you allowing that to block your way? Are you allowing that to hinder you? Oh, I'm not educated. Oh, I don't speak very well. My English is not too good. Oh, you know, you, there's all kinds of things that we allow to hinder us from going ahead, moving ahead, seeing Christ. This man would not let anything stand in the way. When he saw the tree, he said, here is my opportunity. I'm going to climb on that tree and go up higher than anyone else on the tree. And Jesus is bound to notice me. And for sure, Jesus stops right there. And he gets more than what he had bargained for. He only wanted to see Jesus. But Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. I have an appointment with you. Today I am eating at your house. Wow. Can you imagine? I mean, that's what Jesus says in the book of Revelation. I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear the knock in your heart and you have that desire and you open the door, I will come in and I will eat with you. So Zacchaeus get the opportunity to go home with the Lord. Can you believe the anger of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the other important people? And they start to say, he is a Pharisee, a tax collector and a thief. How can you go and eat in his house? Jesus says, I have not come for the righteous. I have not come for the holy, but I have come for the lost that they may find life. You see, that's the heart. He wants people whose heart are longing, but who are willing to step forward and say, I will not allow anything to rob me of my miracle. I will not allow anything to steal my moment with God. I will not allow phone calls to rob me of my moment with God. I will not allow television to rob me of my moment with God. I will not allow, you know, even Jim to take my moment away from me. I must have my moment with my God. This is Zacchaeus. And he got more than a moment with Jesus. He got time in his very own house to house the master, feed the master, fellowship at the feet of the master. No wonder he changed his life and he became a man of God because his heart was fulfilled. What is it that is hindering you? What is it that is standing in your way? What is it that's stopping you from fulfilling every desire in your heart to do for God? Think about it tonight and say, what is stopping me? Is it my position in life? Is it my influence in life? Is it the power that I hold? Is it the wealth that I possess that is hindering me? Or could it be negativity in my life? Could it be low self-esteem? Could it be loss of direction? What is it? Could it be the fear of man, fear of other people, wanting to please other people? What is it that is stopping me from being the person that God wants me to be? 
we have to work that one out. Each one must work it out for themselves. You spend the time looking at your own life. God, what is my biggest fear? What is that very thing that will steal my joy, steal my relationship with you? I want to get rid of it now. I want to be like Zacchaeus. I want to climb up the tree. I want people to look at me. I don't care whether they laugh at me. I don't care what they do, but I'm going to do it. I'm doing it for me. I want to see Jesus and I'll do whatever it takes for me to be able to see Jesus. Whatever it takes to see Jesus, that's what I will do to see Jesus. Are you also saying, are you willing to do whatever it takes to see Jesus? Are you willing to climb up that tree? Are you willing to humiliate yourself? Are you willing to embarrass yourself before your friends, before your family, before your workmates, before your relatives, the people that you know? Are you willing to be a fool for Jesus? Zacchaeus on that day was a fool before men. The people that first saw him running and going up the tree, the problem said, look at that thief, look at him, look at what he's doing. My goodness, he's got no shame, no dignity whatsoever. But when he came down the tree, walking beside Jesus and going home with Jesus, they all envied him. Oh my God, look at Zechariah. How did he manage to do that? How many people in that crowd wanted Jesus to come to their houses, but they failed because the desire was only in the heart and they did nothing about it. Many of us have such great desires in our hearts, but we are doing absolutely nothing to take a step forward to make those desires materialize or to make those desires come forth, come to pass. So Zacchaeus got more than what he bargained for. He got more than what he bargained for. You know, another thing that really struck me when I was looking, going back to the Samaritan woman, when I was looking at the Samaritan woman, the Bible says it was the sixth hour that Jesus set at that well. It was the sixth hour. You know, the seventh hour is the seventh day, the seventh hour, the seventh times. It all speaks of rest. It all speaks of completion. It all speaks of perfection. So it's in the sixth hour, an hour before it's resting time. Jesus sits and waits for this woman. This woman gets saved in the sixth hour. You know, today I <coughs> say people are getting saved in the 11th hour, the hour just before midnight, the hour just before the last hour of the day. They are calling, they are being saved, they are running. This woman got in in the sixth hour before the seventh hour came. She st stood in because Jesus was waiting for her at the well. God is waiting for you. Jesus is waiting for you. We are one hour before midnight. We are one hour before midnight. And the call is saying, get ready, be ready for the bridegroom is coming. Get ready. You know, are you ready? One hour before midnight. Can you imagine being a bride, knowing that there's one hour before the wedding takes place? I mean, there's so much acceleration. You want to be ready. You want to make sure the cars are outside. All the bridesmaids are there. The little ones are there. The rings are there. You want to make sure the hall is prepared. The cake is there. The priest is there. Everything is in place. One hour before the wedding, you are ticking boxes. Is the cake there? Yes. Is the priest ready? Yes. Are the bridesmaids dressed up? Yes. Is the makeup person doing makeup? Yes. What about the hairdressers? Are they finished doing hair? Yes. You are looking. You are preparing. You are making yourself ready. And the Bible says he is coming for a bride who has made herself ready. For a bride who has made herself ready. He is not coming for a bride who just jumped out of bed in their pajamas. They are yawning. Oh my God, it's one hour before the wedding. Oh, I haven't done anything. Oh, oh, the bride is waiting. Oh, I'm two hours late now. I'm three hours late now. You see, with this wedding, 
You cannot afford to be one second late. With the natural wedding, the brides are always late. But let me warn you, with this wedding, you cannot be a second late. You got to be on time because when the clock strikes, if you are not in, the door will shut and you will be left outside. So let us begin to prepare. Start by looking at your life. What is hindering you this morning? What is hindering you? I'll never forget, years back, I was asked to officiate a funeral service. I didn't know the lady that died. Never met her, never seen her. But their pastor was not available. So I agreed. And I went, the funeral took place, everything was going on. And I remember very clearly, because something that transformed my life, I was standing at the graveyard, at the graveside, and... The coffin was going down and I heard a voice in my spirit saying, here is, a, a, what's the word, a, not a soldier, here is, you know, a, a person who failed to fulfill their commission in life. They failed to fulfill their commission, their purpose in life. And I thought, wow, they failed to fulfill their purpose in life. And, you know, the coffin went, we did everything, put the flowers, went away. I went to the elder of the church. I say, can you tell me a little bit about this lady that we have just buried? Who was she? And he says, oh, it's a very sad story. I said, why? Oh, she was a member here in the church. And, you know, one of those active people who had a call of God, wanted to save God, really was on fire for God. Then she picked up an offense. We don't even know what offense she picked up. And we didn't see her. We followed her, followed her. She wouldn't come back to church. The next thing we heard, she was fellowshipping somewhere else. And then we heard she had come out of that somewhere else. And she was now wandering around. She was nowhere. Then the next thing we heard, she was dead. And because we used to know her, we decided to bury her. And I thought, wow. That's why the Holy Spirit was saying, here is somebody who had such great potential, but allowed something to hinder them. They allowed something to hinder them, and they failed to fulfill their purpose in life. They failed to fulfill the mission of God in their life. What is hindering you today? What is that thing that is hindering you from fulfilling your purpose in life, from fulfilling your mission? Every single one of us is born with a purpose, born with a mission to accomplish. There is a purpose for you being here on earth. Your purpose is not just to breathe, to eat, to work, to make money. And no, there is more to life than just working and making money and buying property. There is more to life than that. And each one of us need to find our purpose. We need to fulfill our purpose, knowing and understanding that we are going to give an account of every gift God put inside of us, of the purpose that were never fulfilled, the gifts that were never used. We are all responsible stewards before God. So I want to challenge you this evening to say, look at your life. Don't look at somebody else. You know, Christians, our problem, we are very good at shoveling. You know, we are very good to shovel things. We always go to church with a spade. And you know, as the word is being preached, we are shoveling it. Oh, this is for this is for Martha. This is for Mary. That's for Joseph. That's for John. That one's for Mark. And this one is for this one. And nothing ever remains for me. You know, the word is always for everybody else. I think it's time we stopped shoveling the word to other people and begin to look within ourselves and say, what is hindering me from being the kind of person that God wants me to be? What is hindering me from fulfilling my calling in life? What is hindering me from reaching out? What is hindering me from loving, from being open, from forgiving? You know, from being kind and compassionate. What is hindering me from being a better person in myself? What is hindering me from being a happy person, a joyful person, 
instead of always being anxious, worried, concerned, you know, angry, bitter, frustrated. What is hindering you from being the person that God wants to be? In closing, I want to remind you that Naaman almost missed his miracle because of pride. Almost missed his miracle because of pride. But the rich young ruler missed eternal life because of fame, because of wanting the, the respect of people, because of wanting position and power. He missed eternal life for that. He allowed those things to stand between him and eternal life. He turned away and walked away from lights itself. Jesus said, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door by which all men enter. And he turned away at the door. He was face to face with the door. He was face to face with the way. He was face to face with eternal life. But he turned his back because he allowed the things of this world to hinder him. And then we look at the Samaritan woman. She wouldn't allow her, her fake life. She wouldn't allow her masks that she puts on to stand between her and the Lord. She was thirsty, thirsty for a new life, thirsty for change. And here was the, the well of living waters right next to the natural well that had water that couldn't save her. And she recognized and she says, I'll take out my mask. I'll take out my pretenses. I'll lay them all down. I'm going to come openly to, to this life-giving source and say, this is me. I'm the city prostitute. That's what they call me, and I deserve that name. But I'm tired of it. I'm thirsty for change. I desire change. I want to get back my destiny. I want to get back whatever God intended for my life. I don't want to live the rest of my life being called a prostitute. I want to, to change. And from that day, she was no longer called a prostitute in the city. She was the great evangelist, the Samaritan woman. She earned it because she came to the source, the river, took off a mask, took off her pretenses, and become real before God. Some of us need to become real before God. We need to come out openly and be real with God. God, here I am. This is my situation. This is my problem. These are my weaknesses, Lord. These are my struggles. That's what I'm struggling with. I am tired of it. I want to lay it down. I'm not pretending anymore. I want change. That's what some of us need. Some of us, we must be, we must be like Zacchaeus. We must be like Zacchaeus, the majority of us. We must be like Zacchaeus. We must go for what we want. We must understand the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violence take it by force. You must learn to take by force. You must learn to press on. You must learn to press and press and press. We sing that song, I press, I press, I press. You must press on to the kingdom. Never give up. You must press on. Zacchaeus pressed on. His height was a disadvantage to him. His, I mean, honestly, his testimony was a disadvantage to him. Is your testimony a disadvantage? Do you have a negative testimony among men? Is it a disadvantage to you? Is your physical status a disadvantage for you? You come out and not be ashamed like Zacchaeus came out. You go on that tree, climb that tree and say, no matter what it takes, I'm going to see Jesus. No matter what it takes. You know, you know the story of the woman with the issue of blood? She did not allow her sickness to stand in the way. She did not allow her bleedings to stand in the way. She did not allow the laws of the land to stand in the way. She said, I am coming out of the house and I am going out there and I'm going to meet Jesus, even if it's just to touch the hem of his garment, but I'm going to touch him and I'm not going to let the crowds hinder me. I'm not going to 
let my sickness, my weak body hinder me. I'm not going to let anything. She was willing to crawl, you know. She was willing to push and shove and crawl and go. And she got to where she wanted to get. Where there is a will, there's always a way. Where there is a will, there's always a way. This woman was close to dying after she was bleeding. She was anemic. She had no more blood left in her. But with the last strength that she had in her body, she says, even if I die at the feet of Jesus, I am getting to the feet of Jesus. And even if I have to crawl under the people to get to the feet of Jesus, I am getting to the feet of Jesus. She got to the feet of Jesus, managed to grab hold of that garment, grab hold of that garment, and immediately a miracle took place. And immediately Jesus stopped right there and said, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. The disciples say, Master, how can you say somebody touched you? Everybody is touching you. You see, everybody is calling Jesus, Jesus. But there is a call that brings the Lord to a standstill. Everyone is crying, Lord, Lord. But there is a cry that brings the Lord to a standstill. Everybody was shoving and pushing and shoving and pushing and touching. But there was a touch that brought the Lord to a standstill. He says, ah, uh ah, -uh, somebody touched me. It was not an ordinary touch. It was a touch of faith. It was a touch of desire. It was a touch of love. You know, we need to stretch our faith further. We need to, we need to run with it. Zacchaeus if that was the touch of faith. That's what Jesus saw. If this man can go to so much trouble to even climb up a tree and not be ashamed of his status, ashamed of his workers or his children or the other competitors in the city, then he is worthy of my, my, my time. He is worthy of my time. Jesus stopped for Zechariah. Jesus stopped for the woman with the issue of blood. He says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go your way. Because why? She had not allowed her sickness to hinder her. She had not allowed, you know, her weak body to stand in the way. She had not allowed a fear of people to stand in the way. She had not allowed the doctor's diagnosis to stand in the way. She had not allowed any negative thing to stand in the way. What is hindering your miracle today? Is it the diagnosis the doctor gave you? Is it what everybody is saying about you? Is, is it the sins that you have committed in your past and the devil is bringing condemnation into your life and that is what's hindering you? It's time you begin to know that God is not interested in what you did yesterday. Day. He is interested in what you are doing today and what you are going to do tomorrow. So like Zacchaeus, come to him. When Zacchaeus came, he was still a thief, a tax collector, a sinner, a hated man in the city. But Jesus didn't care about those things. He went to dine with him because he opened his heart and he says, Jesus, come into my home. And Jesus stepped in. And Zacchaeus, it is time with the Lord. And that's what I want to encourage us all to do tonight. Go home, look at your life. What is hindering you? What is hindering you? Is it sickness in your body? Is the sickness weighing you down so much? Is it because of discouragement? Is it rejection? Is it bitterness? Is it frustration? What is it that is hindering you to, today? What is it that is standing between you and your miracle? Standing between you and your salvation? Standing between you and your destiny? You know, many times we think that the witches are standing between us and our destiny. Let me tell you something. They do not have the power nor authority to stand between you and your destiny. Jesus said you can speak to the mountain and command that mountain to move out of your way. So what is hindering us is not other people. It's not other things. What is hindering you is yourself. It is you who is hindering you. Look within yourself and see what is hindering you. For too long, 
we have been taught to look at everybody else this one is hindering me this one is blocking my ministry this one is robbing me no 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 look inside for the things that hinder you. When you have found the things that hinder you from the inside, you deal with those things. You break through in those things with determination and desire, with the love of God in your heart and the desire for, for, for the right thing. God will empower you. And once you have overcome in that area, believe me, nobody will stop you. The whole of that city, they couldn't stop Jesus going into Zacchaeus' house. They said all things. He's a thief. He's a tax collector. He stole my money. He overcharged my taxes. He they brought all kinds of accusations. But Jesus continued to walk to, to, to Zacchaeus' house. No matter what other people said about Zacchaeus, Jesus never listened to them because he looked in the heart of Zacchaeus and he saw the desire for change. That's why he says, I have not come for those who are righteous in their own eyes. I have not come for those who are putting on masks. I have not come for people who are still playing church. I have not come for people who are still, you know, making excuses for themselves. I have come for the Samaritan woman who is willing to be open, who is willing to remove her mask and look at me and allow me to see what she really is. I have come for Zacchaeus who is willing to climb up the tree without shame. I've come for Naaman who is willing to put aside his honor, his pride and run into the dirty muddy waters of the Jordan in order to get his miracle. God is coming for people who are willing. Are you willing tonight? Are you willing tonight to deal with whatever it is in your life that is standing between you and your miracle, that is standing between you and your salvation, that is standing between you and eternity are you willing tonight let us pray father in heaven almighty god we come before you lord we bring our hearts and mind father you do not look at the outside of a man but you look in the inside you see what is in our hearts lord those things that we hide before men those things my god that we cover so much Father, you see them all, for there is nothing that is hidden before you. Mighty God, we pray that tonight, every person who's listening, every person who's going to listen to this clip, Father, we pray for conviction. We pray that, my God, you may open the eyes of our understanding, that you may point out to us, Lord, those areas that are hindering, those areas, Lord, that are hindering our lives, that, Father, we may not be like the rich young ruler whom you loved and yet he turned away because he was not willing to deal with the thing that stood between him and you. Father, I pray that all of us, every single one of us, will acknowledge that time is running out, that we need to get ready. We need to put our house in order. We need, my God, to put down our masks. We need, my God, to stop pretending. We need to be willing, my God, to do away with everything that is fake and allow you to see us for what we are, that, my God, we may not miss out in, the eternity, in eternity, in eternal life. Father, we ask you in the mighty name of Jesus that the Holy Spirit will continue with this word in our hearts and not give us peace until we have done something about your word. Your word will not return void. It will touch lives and it will transform people in Jesus' mighty name. We give you praise, we give you glory, and we give you honor. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You know, after I heard about that woman that I buried, I made a choice, a conscious choice, a decision. I said, Father, when I die when at my funeral, when they are burying me, if I should die before the rapture comes, I would like you to say to somebody, like you say to me, here lies a Christian with mission accomplished. Here lies a, a child who accomplished her call, her mission in life. That's what we desire, that we do the will of God. 
that we are who we are, what God intends for us to be. And that is my prayer for each one of you who are listening to me tonight or who will listen to me after this session is finished. May the Lord bless you and have a good, blessed week. And I speak the blood of Jesus for your covering. Be blessed and stay blessed. Amen.